I'm a travel writing specialist and though I've written on Lawrence before, it's generally been in comparison with other travel writers. So it's a wonderful opportunity for me to hear all these different perspectives and to explore the different facets of his work more closely. Just a little word on speed. Um, I was thinking sometimes because I'm Irish and particularly when I get enthusiastic, I tend to speak extremely rapidly. Something similar to a Laurentian camel ride accelerating <laughs> down. So, if at any point it becomes too much or I'm speaking too quickly and it's become difficult to understand, please just, just raise a hand and I'll decelerate. <laughs> I've mentioned this conference bringing people together. Rebellion, such as that fermented during the Arab revolt, also necessitated bringing people together, albeit people who, according to Lawrence, hated each other with a deadly hatred and fought when they met suddenly. Fortunately, that's not the case here. <laughs> Lawrence craft as spy and mediator was to keep all of these rivals in play until the end of the war. His seditious words slipped into the right ear, helped to bind them in an uneasy alliance. Yet sedition is a tricky thing, even etymologically. Though it's defined as words or conduct bringing people together in an act of rebellion, of course its Indo-European roots translate as a going apart, a separation. My paper today will suggest that in order to effectively bring people together, you must go apart. In order to ferment sedition, you must, paradoxically, remain other. Sedition, like spycraft, operates through hidden meanings and veiled words. Spycraft and sedition, in turn, seed a kind of suspicion. How can one trust a man who sways others to action and yet remains himself unmoved? Lawrence and Bell, as this paper will argue, painstakingly seed the desert from the early years of the 20th century, creating networks of names and contacts, turning the eventual Arab war into a martial form of spycraft. As mobile merchants of words, their loyalties are often questioned. And as we know, Lawrence continuously views his own motives and actions with an angry and suspicious eye. So I'll first examine the figure of the spy and the representation of spycraft in the writing of these two authors, then the rendition of sedition as a necessary trauma, a self-distancing for greater ends, before finally looking at the sense of suspicion that almost tears these writers and their works apart. Seeding suggests the idea of fruition, of success, of an anticipated time of plenty. Yet, as this paper will show, even as they painstakingly seed the desert, Bell and Lawrence both suspect that it will bear bitter fruit. A biography of Lawrence seems somewhat redundant in the present company. Um, however, I wanted to briefly introduce Gertrude Bell just for those who might not be as familiar with her. Um, born in 1868 to a wealthy Northumbrian family, Bell's family and friends were staunch imperialists. Uh, they believed that Britain's presence in the Orient was a noble necessity. Having achieved a first in history at Oxford University, Bell began travelling in 1888, partly perhaps as an escape from social obligations in Britain. Over the next 20 years, she crisscrossed the Middle East from Syria to Persia, uh, creating that web of influence that was used after the First World War to support Faisal, the newly established King of Iraq. In 1916, she became the first female political officer in the Military Intelligence Bureau in Cairo. Yet, Bell, of course, remains on the outskirts of the intelligence community. She was refused permission to work for the military intelligence in Cairo in 1914 on the grounds that the area was too dangerous for a female. And she was later ostracized by her fellow political officers in the Arab Bureau who resented her unorthodox methods. 
Bell and Lawrence, as we've seen today, were towering figures of their age, with public images that they had arguably little control over. <coughs> the Queen of the Desert and Lawrence of Arabia. No, the monikers locate them elsewhere, out there foreign. Their craft is to pass everywhere and be at home nowhere. And so the spy, as we know, is a lonely figure. And yet Lawrence seems to take pleasure in that invisibility. In the night, my color was unseen. I could walk as I pleased, an unconsidered Arab. This sense of, be, of observing without being observed, of being unconsidered, is echoed in the travel writing of the Swiss travel, traveler, Isabel Eberhardt. Um, and she too, traveling at the turn of the century, elected to put on Arab robes. She says, Ils m'ont même pas remarqué. Il n'y a rien de remarquable en moi. Je puis passer partout, inaperçu. Excellente position pour bien voir. As Monsieur Leclerc showed us, clothing is a strategic choice and it reinforces by turns Lawrence, uh, Lawrence's anonymity. Spying is a performance, Lawrence says, in which language and clothing are key to passing. Although Belle remained unconvinced by the virtues of wearing Arab robes, her commitment to intelligence gathering was total. Where in her first travelogue, Persian Pictures, published in 1894, Bell offered snapshots of the desert, the marketplace, the harem, so many commonplaces of the 19th century Orientalist travel log. By 1907, when desert, The Desert and the Sown is published, the detail was sharper, the character portraits and politics more pointed, surveillance photos rather than tourist snapshots. The Desert and the Sun reads at times like a job application. And indeed, the intelligence gathering skills demonstrated in The Desert and the Sun directly influenced her employment in the Arab Bureau. In The Desert and the Sun, Belle is forced to prove the legitimacy of her position and her loyalty to the British government by a skillful marketing of her unique perspective on the Middle East. Bell presents herself in the text as an agent on the ground, able to speak the language without going native. Information, she argues, is key to the Middle East, where the desert wind carries gossip across vast stretches of land. She says, it's scarcely an exaggeration to say that if an English regiment is cut up on the borders of Afghanistan, the English tourist will be mocked at it in the streets of Damascus. Under these conditions, any Western power hoping to effectively control their future Eastern colonies has to have an agent who can use this system of desert gossip to their advantage. Bell's skills in talking to ordinary people and her position as a traveler give her a unique perspective on the Middle East. And she says, to one listening to the talk of the bazaars, to the shopkeepers whose trade is intimately connected with the local conditions in districts very far removed from their own counters, to the muleteers who carry so much more than their loads from city to city, all Asia seems to be linked together by fine chains of relationship. Now, I'm going to bypass a little bit the Orientalism of that statement. Um, not only does Bell understand to a large extent these networks and how to manipulate them, she can also gauge the effect of European policy and act as a goodwill ambassador for the British Empire. The Desert and the Sown is a masterly piece of self-advertisement, a coded message to the British government that illustrates both her statecraft and her spycraft. We can do no more than report for any that may care to listen. What falls from the lips of those who, surround, who sit around our campfires and who ride with us across deserts and mountains, for their words are like straws on the flood of, Asian, of Asiatic politics, showing which way the stream is running. Bell's Middle East is one of words and movement, of intelligence gathering on the ground and fast-moving alliances, a world of spies and spycraft. 
it's intriguing to note in this context that in terms of strategy, mobility and secrecy, the Arab war is modelled by Lawrence as a spy's war, highly mobile and waged with words as much as weaponry. Um, and of course, obviously, as we've stated before, uh, Lawrence didn't invent this form of mobile guerrilla warfare, um, but he does articulate it in a very interesting way. His theory of the war is that armies were like plants, immobile, firm-rooted, nourished through long stems to the head. We might be a vapour blowing where we listed. If regular armies were plants, hierarchical, immobile, dependent on their tap roots or supply lines for survival, then Lawrence and his men are like a vapour or a cloud of seeds. And as we all know, those mobile tactics are extremely effective. As he says, after the Mannerzgehagen success, deceptions, which for the ordinary general were just a witty hors d'oeuvre before battle, became for Allenby a major point of strategy. Lawrence uses words on his own side as much as on the enemy to seed doubt, to prevent the headlong enthusiasm of his men to ensure that the Turkish army remains tied up in non-strategic targets. The strength of the Bedouin was to remain as mobile and as widely dispersed as possible, though Lawrence himself seems at times to be increasingly spread thin. He states, ours should be a war of detachment, and he becomes increasingly detached as the war moves on. Throughout his text, Lawrence exposes the tricks of his trade. How buying barley from the Beni Sakar ensures the news of their intended destination is gossiped instantly through to Karak, and their feint against Amman taken for truth. How messages are mutilated by rearranging their figures into nonsense before handing them in code to Faisal. And there again we come back to this idea of Lawrence's willingness to mutilate messages, to cut up letters. Although here, obviously, it's not so much for an aesthetic effect. Um, I think the word mutilated here is very important. Lawrence appears increasingly traumatised by his role as spy, which requires him to keep his various loyalties separate, cut up. His actions are expedient and arguably save the revolt, as in the uh, above episode where Lawrence cuts and pastes an inflammatory dispa dispatch from Faisal's father, King Hussein, to create a new telegram that Faisal can proclaim to his followers has saved all our honour. Lawrence goes on to recount how Faisal then bent aside to whisper in my ear, I'm in the honour of nearly all of us. It's understood between the two men that Lawrence's honour, like his sense of self, has become a tattered thing in the service of sedition. Sedition, as I've said, is a slippery thing. And there's perhaps an edge of that in Bell's preface to The Desert and the Sown, where she says, and since it was better that they should, as far as possible, tell their own tale, I have strung their words, that is, the words of the Arab people she meets, upon the thread of the road. By insisting that the Arabs speak for themselves, Bell elides her own role in framing, representing, and ventriloquizing these words for a British audience. Her choice of the word strung is again revelatory. Bell, like Lawrence, appears at times to be stringing her Arab companions along in the name of British interests, or even, perhaps, stringing them up. Bell's own position within the imperial might of Britain seemed at times to be hanging by a thread. When a family friend, Lord Cromer, recommended her for intelligence work to A.J. Balfour in December 1915, he characterised her somewhat patronisingly, as a very clever woman whose judgment on the broader issues of Near Eastern politics is not altogether to be trusted. This image of Belle as a woman 
uh, trespassing on a male domain is reinforced by the isolation and the cruel treatment that she later receives. Um, and Cornwallis is quite disingenuous when he publishes in 1940 the collection of her Arab bulletins um, and says that she was an acknowledged authority on the Arabs. Of course, she was not acknowledged by members of the intelligence community. Um, I'll perhaps gloss over the suspicion, uh, particularly of Lawrence's clothes and the idea that he is not straight in his dealings, as he says, that he tends to scuttle uh, crab fashion, sideways slipping. Um, Lawrence, as we've seen, stands court-martial on himself and judges that he should indeed be condemned. Um, and since I see the time oh, as you, you sure <laughs> yeah don't don't go crazy just oh, just be aware. you have to stop sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want I'm you to skip your conclusion. <laughs> All right, perfect. But I will I will I will move to to a conclusion. Um, I wanted to look a small bit at the idea of unlimited mobility. Um, where Lawrence appropriates the, the 2,000 camels um, and, and gives this gift of unlimited mobility to his troops. Again, his last request to Allenby is leave to go away. Lawrence always tries to ensure the means to escape, to move on. Um, and in terms of moving on, I perhaps like to, to move to my final point. Um, I was wanting to look a little bit at the idea of landscape as palimpsest, as this idea of a seeded desert with networks of names of words that both Bell and, uh, and Lawrence experience. Um, towards the end of The Seven Pillars, of course, this idea of the landscape as palimpsest is reinforced. Lawrence is haunted by the memory of former battles and of lost comrades. Given the mobile nature of the campaign, He's literally forced to revisit old wounds. On the route to Damascus, as they refill the Rolls' radiators with the horrible water of the pool in which Farage and Dowd had played. Lawrence's sense of a fragmented self, of a deep-seated anger and trauma, of a sense of degradation that's particularly sharp after the assault, the sexual assault at Dera'a, finds little outlet. He says, so meshed in nerves and hesitation, it could not be a thing to be afraid of. Yet it was a real beast. And this book, its mangy skin, dried, stuffed, and set up squarely for men to stare at. Coming in the chapter entitled Myself, it seems quite clear that Lawrence intends this book to translate the psychological effects of his wartime work, to communicate his trauma, even as he anticipates that it will fall short of its target, becoming no more than an oddity for men to stare at. And yet this metaphor of the mangy skin recalls another scene, where Lawrence describes the return of his best riding camel, the venerable mother, Gazala. Her foal had lately died. Abdullah, who rode next to me, had skinned the little carcass and, try and carried the dry pelt behind his saddle like a crupper piece. Dried, stuffed, and set up to stare at. When Ghazala comes to be begins to pace uneasily, picking up her feet like a sword dancer, Abdullah springs from his saddle, calf skin in his hands, and he lands in front of Ghazala, who had come to a standstill, gently moaning. Faithful, indefatigable beast, veteran of many campaigns, seems to be broken in spirit. Of course, there seems to be quite a strong identification here between Lawrence and the beast of the camel, his own broken beast of self. And that very human moaning of the camel again reinforces that anthropomorphization. Unwilling to let the campaign and Lawrence grind to a halt, Abdullah spreads the little hide before the camel and brings down her head to it. She stopped crying, shuffled its dryness thrice with her lips, then lifted her head and with a whimper strode forward. 
there's an almost mystical quality to this scene, and that's reinforced by the archaic thrice. The reader is struck by something at once sacred and debased. Gazelle is forced into further motion by this flat hide, this mangy skin, a poor copy of her child. And that flat, dried skin on the ground, perhaps it's just me, but it inevitably reminds me of a book spread open on the desert sand. This mangy skin, as Lawrence refers later to the text of The Seven Pillars, is enough of an impetus to keep the author going to the end. As though the thought of leaving something for posterity, something that would explain his actions and carry on his legacy, could keep Lawrence moving forward, keep him writing and rewriting The Seven Pillars, despite his intuition that his hope of leaving a, an apt legacy is illusory. Hope springs eternal from the scattered seeds of war. Thank you.